bitterness of soul, unforgiveness, it eats at the interior being like cancer. We notice that the Lord indicates that we cannot expect mercy unless we offer it. It comes again in the Lord's Prayer. Notice that in the two forms of it that we have, the more liturgical one of Matthew and the more intimate one of Luke, this one bit of parallelism is maintained in both. Insisting, therefore, that one cannot hope for forgiveness unless one is ready to extend it. I was talking recently to some lovely travelling people who were concerned that someone was probably going to die in the near future, but there was an issue going on and there was no reconciliation and he was, it would seem, not keen on getting it. I mean within the family. And these, having the simple faith that they have, were aware of the danger of going to meet one's God with this element of unfinished business within the family. People who still don't talk, even at death. But it need not be so externalized or dramatic, it can be in our own bosom. A young man was leading an apparently Christian life, but he had an enemy whom he hated. And, notice this bit, while frequenting the sacraments, he all the while harboured in his heart sentiments of ill will and revenge. After his death, he appeared to his father and told him that he was damned for not having forgiven his enemy. After which he exclaimed with an accent of unutterable sorrow, Ah, oh, if all the stars in heaven were so many tongues of fire, they could not express what torments I endure. One of the principal causes of this malady is envy and jealousy. The great Shakespearean tragedy on that theme, as you know, is Othello. We have this famous one-liner. Beware, my lord, of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster that mocks the one it feeds on. Notice a person who has been frustrated in something, someone else has beaten him to it. What will he do? Every time that person comes up in conversation, he will knock him on the head. He will never have a pleasant word about him. Envy. One can go through life condemning oneself to frustration and therefore unhappiness because one has not learned the secret of the joy of self-contentment in the fullness of the present moment, in what it has to offer, without wanting another form of it. It's the same journey through time. One person is at peace, the other is frustrated. The first reading is extremely powerful. Put on the whole armour of God, panoply. And we have here a reference to what we see in our time. That you may be able to stand against the wiles, 
trickery of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness on high. Wickedness on high. Open the goggle box and witness that in your front room. All the eyes and ears of Ireland are feeding on this pulpit of the principalities of darkness. And we'll see now just how it will function in the indoctrination given on this question of abortion. But this also impacts on life. In the early centuries, one was heard to exclaim regarding the early Christians, see how these Christians love one another. The surrounding culture had noticed a difference in this embryonic culture that would actually form great chunks of the planet. It was not based on hatred. It was not based on vengeance. And say what you like. Look at what grace does to culture. It has done that over the centuries in this land. Ireland still has big traces of it. Goodness, kind-heartedness, neighborliness, generosity. They're all the outworking of grace in culture. You get a puncture, people will come at you and help you out of the woodwork, and so on. It's not the case in every culture. Our teacher and master, the Son of God himself, gave extremely demanding teachings regarding charity. When somebody wishes to smite you on one cheek, turn to him the other also, and so on. He himself, on the cross, pleaded for his murderers. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. So the message has come from the top. We are influenced by the one that we look at and love. Such is not the case in the religion that right now threatens our culture, not so much in Ireland, but in Europe, certainly. The fountainhead is very different. We know that from the very beginning, Violence was the keynote. It makes a difference if we have a master and teacher who in one day can himself engage in beheading hundreds of victims, or if we have one on the cross who pleads for the forgiveness of those who know not what they're doing. It impacts on the whole of our life. Do you think that Satan is not interested in any force which would take away the power of grace, I mean Trinitarian grace, on this planet. He's pushing hard. He's using what is out there, often in good faith, to destroy the means of grace in great chunks of this planet. It's another way of playing the game of Satan and therefore these powers of darkness. In 2007, very strongly, the grace of returning to the quiet life and therefore to Ireland was coming to me in prayer. And I remember how this intuition was given at the same time, which I share with you. We can only do one or two things 
of note in this innings of life. What must be done? And this came to me very strongly. One thing alone depends on me, and this, with the grace of God, I can do. Be warmth. Be a candle. Consuming itself on a daily basis in what? Giving out warmth and light. If that's not happening, all the paraphernalia is in vain. That and that alone is justification for any way of life. And therefore, to just burn and be is enough. To enthrone Jesus Christ and let people meet him, it's enough. And so I got a friend who happened to be studying English from Italy in Dublin to go and visit the bishop, Bishop Smith, who speaks good Italian. They had a good chat together, and later that day, a phone call came from this good Italian. The bishop will take you on. Come and spend a while in Ireland. It was just a message, but it came from the heart of Jesus, because wisdom and providence was there. But also, it came from the heart of a man of God, the bishop. Many bishops field graces for the harm of their diocese. This bishop said yes, and risked, and did everything. There are times when we can actually say yes or no to divine grace, but these yeses and noes have huge impact on the flow of time. There may be people here, young people, who are being solicited in grace and prayer to give themselves to the Lord, but the Lord leaves the key of the will in their hands. Yes or no, God will never command. But the only thing he wants is authenticity, not to take back the gift, but let Jesus reign. And throughout life, just be that candle wherever you are, without taking on all you possibly could in your short innings in life. I just conclude. People make this blunder. They think they have to do spectacular things. Actually, they don't. Which matters most? To be very efficient as a great managing director, even on the church level, or to be a source of healing to any soul that comes close to you. The one may have much limelight, the other very little. But ask the soul that comes which one mattered most in the end. Warmth. I have a call, and tis a simple thing, oft heard, without a word, without a noise, and I know well what messages here bring the silent hours, where all stands yet in poise. I have a call so small that all the earth shall pass it by, for naught to limelight brought will bid it shine. Yet souls of little worth at whiles can mean a smile by some yet sought. I have a call, and this is all I know, mid rubrics high that sanctify 
much pain. Tis but to be, tis but to bid bestow from soul to soul an essence very plain. Good Lord, tis simple this my little call. I shall pass by and do a thing so small.